When Colin Steele McRae was dating his future wife, Allison, he'd often tell her, as he worked on his car, that he'd one day be World Rally Champion. For anyone but Colin, you'd call it his dream. But for the laid back yet utterly determined Scotsman, dream was too soft a word. It wasn't Colin's dream to be the World Rally Champion. In the stony crags of his Scottish psyche, the title was his destiny. So when that destiny was derailed at the Rally de Catalunya in 1995, the 27-year-old was understandably enraged. Racing for Subaru in Spain, Colin was only a couple wins away from securing the championship he'd foretold to Allison years ago. But Subaru wanted Colin, leading the rally event thus far, to ease up and take a loss, allowing his teammate, Spaniard Carlos Sainz, to win in his home country. Colin refused. On the second to last stage, a couple of the team managers literally stood in the road waving to Colin to slow down. He gunned his blue Impreza straight at them, forcing them to jump out of the way. You could wake a man up from a dream, but destiny is immovable. Subaru had told Colin that he had to take time penalties in the last stage or he'd be out of a job. Still, Colin wouldn't listen. There's only one man left who had a chance of changing his mind, Colin's dad, Jimmy. Himself a living rally legend, Jimmy taught Colin everything he knew. Not just about rally, but life. He told his son to take one for the team. Colin had winning in his blood, but now his own blood, his father, was telling him to go against his instincts. Loyalty, the very trait Colin felt Subaru now lacked, was the only true value above winning. Colin begrudgingly took the loss that day. The championship would now come down to the final race of the season in Great Britain. Two million rally fans, most of them drawn to rally because of Colin and his dad, would head to the dreamlike misty woods of Wales to cheer him on. But this was no dream. The sound of Colin's Subaru could wake the dead. This was destiny. On today's past gas, the Flying Scotsman, the Missile of the Thistles, the Deacon of Dirt, Colin Steele McRae, in his road to the World Rally Championship. Past gas podcast it's about cars it's not about sports let's go let's go let's go colin steel let's go let's stop not going <laughs> yep this is a uh a, we're gonna do a two-part series on colin mccray finally we've gotten a lot of requests for for years uh, Mr. McRae. You, for, for years for years you guys yeah. have been asking us to do something on colin mccray for years That's people right. have been saying you don't have a podcast but when you do do it on colin mccray <laughs> People wanted uh, up to speed for ever on Colin McRae, yeah. and I just we just didn't feel like it was a long enough format. So now that we have this long format, we can talk about something for two hours straight. Give it its due diligence. Give That's it right. Its uh, due diligence. And at this point in the podcast, I feel like we're uh, we're good enough at podcasting now to do this story <laughs> justice. So yeah. now we're well, doing we're it. Get, we're getting there. We're uh, getting it. It's good. It's a, it'll be it'll be a hard fought game. There's a chance that we'll do this story justice. Yeah, I think yeah. so. Uh, the missile in the thistles is like the most badass yet most like European. Uh, it's yeah, so British, ever. yeah. Thistles. The missile. He's the missile of the thistles. Eh? <laughs> yeah, thistles mm -hmm. is what like Eeyore eight in winnie the pooh <laughs> <laughs> yeah so if you're unfamiliar with colin mccray he's basically the reason uh that you know what a subaru is um he's well that's a bit of a stretch but he definitely made the uh the the classic blue and green livery so iconic um blue and yellow blue and, blue and it's, gold it's like a green it's like a it's like a neon yellow green yeah he is like uh yeah, Colin McRae is the Subaru as uh, Michael Jordan is to Nike. Yes, absolutely. Um, he also, but he didn't. He didn't race every. Uh, he didn't do every race in a Subaru, as we'll learn. Uh, he's also the reason that the Dirt series exists. He's the reason that James and I are in a video game. Um, Me too. Because you know, first there was Colin McRae Rally, and then Colin McRae's Dirt, and all that. Uh, yeah, very uh, iconic figure in the world of rally. I think it's amazing just from, I think the most amazing part of that intro was that 2 million people showed up to a race. To a rally what is race. That? <laughs> that, is, <laughs> that is a ridiculous amount of people. That's got to be up there for like most, you know, if you would call this a sporting competition. Yeah. Most people attending a sporting competition. Like how many people fit into the Staples Center? Not 2 uh, million. 
between like weird. 10 and 100 probably whoa that's What's pretty a, wide <laughs> what is sofi is our new one do you think they're gonna have any rally rally competitions maybe like xbox or xbox x games well now that x yeah, games now that grc is done they had the X game or they had X games rally rally cross at uh, the, the Coliseum. Yeah, it yeah. ended there, right? That was like, I mean, we'll save this for the next one, but that was like a big win for him, right? Uh, I don't I don't remember if he won or not, but yeah, Colin McRae race there in that golden uh, Hawkeye Subaru. Yeah, I, I believe sponsored by No Fear at the time. Oh, I tight. think he, he flipped over and then he kept driving. That's right. Yeah. No Fear taught me that. Pain is just weakness leaving the body. Oh, that's yeah, a yeah. um when I was in seventh grade, uh mm-hmm. I had the crush on this girl and she had a shirt that said that. I had a shirt that said that. No fear. Yeah, and I remember walking out of Mr. Canapa's math class and being like, That's a cool shirt. Uh anyway. I think it's interesting that a seventh grade girl was wearing a shirt that said pain is just weakness leaving the yeah. body. Like was she a power yeah. lifter? Looking back on that, that is a strange shirt choice for sure. I had a no fear shirt that said pain is just uh weakness leaving the body in like fourth grade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> There's like anyone had, who knows about pain. Yeah, it's like a ten year old boy. Like when you fall on your rollerblades and you skin <laughs> your <laughs> knees. That's just weakness leaving that's the body. That's just weakness. That's not that's not your bone leaving your body. That's just weakness. When you trip and fall on your when you're rollerblading on the tennis court cuz it's the smoothest. <laughs> <laughs> um Second anyway, place is the first loser. <laughs> I no fear. I maybe it's just because I've uh Maybe maybe Formula One is kind of num- the dominance of Mercedes has kind of numbed me to expecting a different winner every time. But like, I'm totally cool with getting a podium position rather than winning outright. But you prefer that over getting a first place finish? I do not prefer that. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying like, yeah. Why did you say that you prefer that? I did. <laughs> Dude, some Let's just get into it. How about no that? No fear shirts are weird. It's not the pace of life that concerns me. It's the sudden stop at the end. Oh God! No fear. You know what? Never had any weird toxic messages. Is big dogs. That was always very supportive. Yeah. All right. Let's let's get into it. Colin <laughs> McRae, Colin Steele McRae, rather, was born in Lanark, Scotland, on August fifth, nineteen sixty eight, to Margaret and Jimmy McRae. Uh, they were a working class family. Colin's granddad was a blacksmith, and Jimmy, his father, was a plumber. It was Papa Jimmy who would unknowingly change the trajectory of the McRae clan forever and rally history by extension by proving once and for all that Super Mario wasn't the only plumber who could race cars. Uh? Eh? In the early 70s, at this point, Colin was a young kid, Jimmy paid a few hundred pounds for a used four-door Ford Cortina Mark I. On the outside, it was an unremarkable family sedan, but on the inside... It had been upgraded with a Lotus twin cam engine tune oh. for rally racing. Oh, um, yeah, the Cortina. Even though it's uh, kind of a boring looking car, it is def- it's I, like one of those early rally legend mm-hmm, cars. Yeah. I love the the Lotus Cortinas. Yeah, uh, Cosworth. Uh, Cosworth started. Cosworth messed around with his car a bunch. Uh, there, there's one on Bring a Trailer right now with an F20 in it, the S2000 engine. Ooh. That's cool. Pretty cool. Anyway, after fixing up the Cortina, Jimmy did the next natural thing you do with a car, and that is race it. He took the Cortina to a local rally event in 1974, and although he had zero experience, remember that Jimmy was a plumber, a working man, he managed a respectable 11th place. In a recent interview, Jimmy credited the Scottish countryside for helping shape his talent for rally. In his words, I can't do a Scottish accent. It's often lovely. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> uh maybe you just do the quotes this we just whoever's reading it's i can't do a scottish accent either I, i've spent a lot of a lot of time on scottish twitter i i still i still don't know shrek was scottish right <laughs> <laughs> you can't just do shrek <laughs> don't care <laughs> i'm gonna pick a fight it's often lovely around the Lenark, but we also yes. get a combination of adverse weather and the surrounding road network helps drivers pick up essential skills you have to understand how to read the road. 
and that definitely helped me. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was great. <laughs> Perfect. It just seems very disrespectful. <laughs> you, it does. It definitely does. Um, anyway, after finishing uh, respectively in a few races, a fellow driver offered to buy the Cortina for twice what Jimmy paid. He took the cash and used it to upgrade to a more modern Mark I Ford Escort, a front-engine rear-wheel drive coupe, which at that point in the 70s was among the most popular cars in rally. And, of course, this is one of those Fords that we don't, we never got over here in the U.S., unfortunately. Yeah, I know. They're so they're cool. They're super sick. Uh, this is the car that um, Paul Walker drove in uh, Fast 6, or was really? it Furious 6? Yeah, he drove it. He had one of these. Didn't he have, like, a, a Ken Mary or something in one of them? May, probably i don't think that was ever a hero car though no. no in the beginning he's just driving in like mexico or something yeah he's just chilling jimmy continued to do well but he was just one in a crowd of escort drivers he knew that to build a career in rally you didn't just have to win you had to stand out and in that era rally occupied a gray area between amateur and professional motorsport often the difference was how willing a skilled driver was to hustle for money and sponsors so he approached Vauxhall about driving their Magnum sedan in Rally. And uh, Vauxhall is one of GM's brands over there in Europe. They said yes, and Jimmy left behind plumbing floaters for a life of thrumming motors. It was the start of a fruitful relationship between Jimmy and Vauxhall's parent company, General Motors. Eventually, switching over to Opel, another GM company, Jimmy won the British Rally Championship for the first time in 1981. This kicked off a decade of domination for the Rally driver, He'd go on to win the British title five times in the 80s. Jimmy's one regret, as he looked back on his career decades later, was that as Rally got huge in the 80s, he never took a real shot at competing on the international stage, namely in the World Rally Championship. His sponsors wanted to keep Jimmy racing in England, where his name could help market GM's cars to British fans. Instead, it was his son, Colin, who would one day have the chance to make the McRae name known not just in England, but worldwide. I can relate to this because my dad's name is Jimmy as well. And he had a lot of regrets. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, your predecessors walk so you can run. And in the case of the McCrays, Jimmy rallied so Colin could rally even faster. And keep in mind, this wasn't a case of Jimmy forcing his vision on Colin. With all three of his sons, Jimmy gave them the option to be as involved or uninvolved with racing as they wanted to be. Stuart, one of Colin's younger brothers, never raced at all, but Colin was all in. As Jimmy would later recall, from the moment I began rallying, working at home in the garage on the Cortina, then the Escort, my first Magnum, Colin would always be there, watching what I was doing. He could be a pain in the backside sometimes, but his interest was obvious. <laughs> I like that he has to like mention, like, sometimes, honestly, it was a bit much. <laughs> but, you know, you could tell he was into it. Uh, interest was an understatement. Colin was enraptured. In his estimation, any young person would give their right arm to be a part of something like that. It's safe to say that what he's referring to by something like that was not just rally, but having a dad who made room for his son and pursuing his passion. Colin later professed to be someone who didn't believe in heroes. He simply admired people who set goals and accomplished them. In that sense, he mused, his father, Jimmy, was his hero. Of course, Colin soon went beyond mere observation. At the age of 11, he got his start racing on motorbikes. He tried to be sneaky, but Jimmy remembered constantly coming home to find his bikes in a different part of the garage, sometimes with scruffs that hadn't been there before. Colin's first bike that he owned and his first real racing love was his red Honda XR75, a bike he drove to victory in countless motocross events. Colin so loved his Honda that... Well after he'd become a racing legend with a collection of countless priceless cars, the humble XR75 he'd raced as a kid still had a place of honor in his personal garage. The transition to four wheels happened not because of pressure from Colin's dad, but his mother, Margaret. Margaret worried about the danger of motorcycle racing, and this was maybe the first time this sentiment had been expressed in motherly history, thought driving rally cars would be a safer <laughs> alternative for her son. So, Colin started driving rally cars. Even before he could reach the pedals, Colin would sit in his dad's lap and steer. By the age of 14, around the time his dad won his first British championship, Colin was accompanying Jimmy to rally events, where he'd soaked up information like a sponge. In rally, as with other types of racing, drivers run tests to get used to the stages before the actual run, and Jimmy would allow his son to man or, more accurately, 
boy. <laughs> the navigation seat. Navigating in rally requires you to know the course even better than the driver. And those early experiences must have been incredibly formative. For I Colin. would really like to try co-driving sometime. Me too. Um, I would also like to drive on a rally course. But Nolan, you should sit on my lap as I and steer as I drive. <laughs> <laughs> that should be a challenge for the next like uh kia car wars i don't do. know if you guys would fit no we're both pretty big <laughs> um i would love to have... try uh to give uh pace uh pace notes and all that kind of stuff i think that'd be really fun uh we have te- we have tentative plans to build a rally car for something we're just beginning to talk about it and one of the ideas is that we uh we all audition to be the uh driver and the navigator hell yeah I still maintain that I'm the fastest driver at Donut right now. And we don't need to test it at all. <laughs> Before he even had a license, Colin was learning to drive in his family's Mini Cooper. But once he turned 16, it was time for an upgrade. For his debut race, he borrowed a friend's Hillman Avenger. Apparently, the deal was that if Colin helped fit the car with a new gearbox, he could race the car. But it was clear Colin would need to purchase a car of his own if he was going to give Rally a shot. His parents pitched in and got Colin his first car, a humble red Talbot Sunbeam. A photo from that time shows Colin posing next to the boxy car before a rally, hands in his pockets, looking for all the world like a kid dressed up as a rally driver for Halloween. He does look really nervous. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, you know what? Um, These are cool. Yeah, yeah there's, a, uh, there's a version of this car. I, I think Lotus or Cosworth built the engine, of course. And uh, made it really fast. It's in Forza Horizon 4, in fact. Can you, like, what would you guys do if I came to you and I was like, all right, listen, I'm going to get in a rally. Let me borrow your car. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be uh, like, if you buy me a new transmission, maybe if you install I it. I know you're going to break that transmission. I've never driven a rally car. <laughs> in fact, I just got my license. <laughs> <laughs> Let me borrow your car. The Sunbeam only cost 850 pounds, cheap even for the time, especially compared to the 10 or 20,000 pounds you could easily spend on a more powerful rally car. There was no turbo, fuel injection system, or any bells and whistles. Still, Jimmy stressed to his son that it was crucial for Colin to understand the value of the cars he drove. It was a classic lesson in Scottish frugality, and Colin learned it well. Same as his Honda motorcycle. Colin kept the Talbot his entire career. Its value decades later measured not in pounds, but precious memories. That's a good no fear shirt. Yeah, dude. Value not is not measured in pounds, but in memories. <laughs> no fear. No fear. On the dirt, Colin quickly proved he was worthy of the McRae name. Racing at a club level, he had a huge advantage, given that his dad had a full service crew that could help out. Whereas the Sunday drivers he was competing against had to work on their cars themselves. Yeah, it's a bit of a leg up. That being said, Colin was very hands-on with his cars and quickly became a respected mechanic in his own right. Colin quickly developed a signature style, best summarized by his frequently quoted racing motto, if in doubt, flat out. In the world of rally, speed is often seen as an impulse that must be tempered with technical precision and strategy. While Colin was definitely a well-rounded driver, he quickly developed a reputation and a fan following for his willingness to throw the balanced approach out the window. Instead, his goal was to start fast, middle fast, finish fast, and win. That's how I approach everything. Yeah. Finish fast. <laughs> <laughs> Next up for Colin was his first entry in the Scottish Rally Championship, where he would place a respectable 18th. Impressive stuff for a teenager who couldn't yet legally order a pint. He was also awarded the Flying Brick Award given to the driver who raced the hardest trial. While it's unclear exactly what was meant by the hardest trial, it's safe to say that it involved some sort of aggressive maneuvering. And the fact that his little Talbot also looked like a brick, you know, might have helped him win that <laughs> award. Off the track, Colin displayed a similar level of quiet confidence. At the age of 18, he was riding along with his buddy in a landscaping truck when he saw a local girl named Allison Hamilton driving on the road ahead of them. Colin asked his friend, who happened to be Allison's brother, to catch up with a teenage girl ahead of them. And when they did, Colin, in Allison's recollection, quote, 
hit me with a few good chat up lines. Whatever those lines were, they worked, and the two soon started dating. That's cute. Allison found Colin's confidence extended beyond the realm of cheeky bants. The young McRae, in Allison's recollection, always had a great belief in himself. Like we mentioned in the opening, Colin, still a teenager, boldly told his girlfriend that he would one day be World Rally Champion. Nobody yet knew whether that assertion was fact or folly, but Colin's confidence was undeniable. Before he could be World Rally Champion, however, Colin would first need to prove that he could compete and win at the highest level of the sport. I actually uh, found the chat-up lines uh, oh, yeah? that we were talking about. Yeah. Oh, did you? Yeah, he goes. He says, uh, I love you. I always have. I want to marry you. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's Amazing. real? Uh, yeah. That's 100% confirmed real. In the legacy of a family, it's traditionally the son who shares and carries on the mythology of the father. When that natural order is inverted and the father is the one sharing the story of his son, you know tragedy must be involved. We'll get to the sad final chapters of Colin's life in the next episode, but first, this is Colin as his father remembered him early on in his racing days. I actually co-drove for Colin at the start of his career on the Galloway Hills rally in his 1300 Nova. He probably frightened me, but I realized pretty quickly that he had talent. But it wasn't just his speed. It was his mechanical sympathy towards the car. Hmm. That was really special, particularly when you considered how quickly it was going. That marked him out, as did the results he got with the Nova. I really like the phrase mechanical sympathy. Yeah, I me love too. That. That's sick. Yeah. That's like uh, the name of our band. <laughs> yeah. The Donut do. Side Project. Uh, the Nova in question was Colin's first big boy rally car, 1300cc terror made by Jimmy's sponsor, Vauxhall. The Nova was Vauxhall's spin on the Opel Corsa, a front engine, front wheel drive car homologated for Group A rally. While it would pale in comparison to the more powerful cars Colin would soon be driving, the Nova fit a modest amount of power into a tiny frame, just like Bridget. It had 93 horsepower <laughs> and, zero to, uh, and a 0-60 to time of 8.9 seconds, but more so in rally than any other motorsport. It was what you did with it. In Colin's words, straight roads are for fast cars. Turns are for fast drivers. Ooh, great quote. That's cool. That's Love that. Yeah. This guy's got some good quotes. All drivers do somehow. Like every <laughs> race car driver just says the tightest stuff. Yeah, constantly. like Bruce McLaren. Bruce McLaren had some really great quotes Smokey in that episode. Unic, Carol Smokey Shelby, Unix, of course. Uh, uh, Ken the guys, Miles. The guys in the uh, the 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 uh, uh, Isle of Man episode. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Just yeah. like I think it's something about like that speed and like the way that your brain operates, where you're just like like you have a like a different meditative state or something. Yeah, like you it just, changes you. You just see things differently. Yeah, I'm built different. I'm, <laughs> I'm built, just built different. different dude. No fear. <laughs> <laughs> it was 1987 in Sweden that Colin, now 18, would drive the Nova in his first official World Rally Championship event. He wouldn't have to do it alone as Ian Grindrod, <laughs> Colin's dad's <laughs> navigator, volunteered to navigate for his teammate's kid. Things got off to a rough start, however, as on the recce, that's rally slang for a reconnaissance run. Colin collided with a sob on the course, and the resulting impact broke poor Ian Grindrod's sternum. Of course you're going to run into a sob in Sweden. Oh, of <laughs> course. They're freaking like they're like deer in Florida. You got <laughs> you to gotta controlled hunt them or else they're, they're beautiful, but they're pests. Are there a lot of deer in Florida? I think like deer are pests in a number of places. Did you hear about all the like horse meat that is being sold on the side of the roads in Florida. What the heck? And then like repackaged or like, you know, this is beef, but it's actually horse meat. What? Ugh. I'm not going to buy beef from the side of the road. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You mean that beef I bought on the side of the road is horse meat? Wait, 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 wait. Let's rewind a little bit. Uh, and <laughs> let's talk about yeah, your decision making abilities. <laughs> Huge thanks to the World Series of Poker app for sponsoring this episode of Pass Gas. Have you ever watched the World Series of Poker and you're like, man, I wish I was at that final table with Phil Ivey and Phil Halmuth and all the rest of the Phils? 
Well, the good news is that the World Series of Poker now has a cool app where you can play poker anytime. You can play real-time poker with poker fans from around the world whenever you want. You can test your hold'em skills in virtual cash games, play in casino mode or go up against the house, connect to your Facebook account and set up a virtual table with friends. Everyone's at home right now. You ever text your friend Derek? Yo, man, want to play poker? I know you're home. Well, get him on this app. That's as close as you can get to the real deal without the $10,000 buy-in. I love playing poker. I've been playing poker for most of my life. My family is a poker family. So this is like the perfect app for me. The cool thing about the World Series of Poker app is that you can play it anytime. It's free to download, and it's a great way to improve your poker skills. It's the number one free poker game there's a bunch of fun events too, like holiday events, tournaments, stuff like that. And the best part is if you join today, you get 1 million free chips. So what's the holdup? Download the WSOP app today on Apple App Store or Google Play or Amazon Now. And if you use the promo code WSOPGAS, you get 1 million free chips when you sign up. That's a good deal. So go and claim your 1 million free chips and download the WSOP app wherever you get your apps. Use the promo code WSOPGAS. Thank you, World Series of Poker! So, so Grind, Grindrod broke his sternum. Right, right. Interestingly enough, Colin's first taste of victory would come with Allison in the Navigator scene. Ooh, cool. The event was the 1988 Tweedies Daihatsu Rally. Colin was Great. behind the wheel of another borrowed car, a Nissan 240RS. The RS was a no-frills, built-to-be-raced rally car Whoa. with stripped-down dash and Frankenstein-like bolted on trapezoid wheel wells. This thing is cool. Yeah, so it's, in other words, it's got a big wide-body kit on it. Uh, I, I think this came up in some episode Ooh, of this Up thing. to Speed. It's super Rules. sick. I love it. Dang, this looks like, quite the like a Nissan Cutlass. <laughs> it is very G-body inspired, for sure. Very boxy looking. Um, it's got some cool wire mesh, not wires, literally, but like mesh, it's got cool mesh wheels. Yeah. And the dang, the, the, the dash players kind of look like the N2 kit for the eight, six shouts out to more skids, more skids on YouTube. It's one of my favorite YouTube channels. Guys got a really cool a 86. Check out more skids. Give them a follow. Tell them that James sent you. Allison was alarmed when she saw that the Nissan speedometer went up to what she interpreted as 200 miles per hour and only somewhat reassured when Colin told her it was only kilometers. No matter how you measured it, Colin found the speed he needed and took his first rally win. Cool. Yeah, rally's cool because like they're not go like they're geared super low, super shortly, like they're shifting through gears super quickly. Mm -hmm. They don't have a super high top speed, but you're still going like 100 miles an hour right next to trees and it's just oh, like yeah. a all it's a momentum game yeah super sick looking back on the win years later colin remarked by that time i had proven i could move reasonably quickly <laughs> <laughs> that's charming uh that is a remark for sure a comic understatement was a signature of the dry scotsman proving i can move reasonably quickly sounds like he got a hip replacement not a first place trophy he was also humble in his acknowledgement of the support his father had given him, although it came with a hint of resentment as the expectations built around his career. In Colin's words, obviously being the son of a famous rallying father has its advantages, but also has its disadvantages as well. You never really got the credit you deserve for a good finish because of who you were, but you certainly got criticized when you didn't have a good finish. Yeah, people only notice when you do stuff wrong. On the track, those concerns melted away. Colin loved the Zen state of driving rally, which demanded laser focus on every turn of every stage. The plan, masterminded by Jimmy, was for Colin to max out his skill on the less powerful Group A Nova before permanently making the jump to more powerful cars. The hitch was that as of 1986, Group B had been abolished due to growing safety concerns, i.e. it was <laughs> ridiculous and should have never happened in the first place, even though we're really glad it did. That meant that the less powerful Group A cars Colin started out driving were now the standard. The golden era of Group B was now over, and it would be up to Colin and the emerging drivers of the new era to define what was next for Rally. Colin started winning consistently in smaller events. His strongest showing yet was a ninth place finish at the 1988 Scottish Rally Championship. The winner? His father, Jimmy. Ooh. By 1988, Colin's success had caught the eye of Peugeot. 
uh, who yep. offered him a tryout of sorts for the 1988 World Rally season, offering the young driver selected drives throughout the season. Colin accepted, and with that decision, the apprenticeship phase of his rally career was complete. Him and his father could now be considered competitors on the same level, but cool. Colin's goal was to not equal his father. It was to do what his dad couldn't. It was to win a World Rally Championship. Hell yeah. I'm glad that we're, do- we're telling this story. I do want to tell like a more in-depth um, uh, telling of like, group b history and just like oh yeah all this like the cool the cars and all that are obviously very cool but i'd really like to know a lot more of the behind the scenes manufacturer um kind of posturing you know Mm -hmm. yeah um because it's pretty amazing that like giant companies like audi were able who were like yeah sure let's build a car meant for going for being airborne between trees you know yeah Yeah. (laughs) god that's got to be terrifying just watching that last Jim Connor, when he's on the normal road and he flies oh like 200 feet, I'm yeah. like, that was the, uh, I was like, oh God. And dude, there was like a tree next to the road right there yeah. where he was like landing. I was like, if they got the speed wrong and like he re- landed weirdly, like he, he could have crashed, you know? Yeah. There could have been a lot of things that could have sent him in, into a tree or flipped over or something. It's just, yeah. Uh, I oh, don't have that in you know me what? to. Do Travis that. Travis Pastrana would be a great pass gas, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah, let I'd us love... know in the comments if you want us to do a pass gas on Travi P. I love I like <laughs> Travi P was one of my like childhood heroes, you know. I think he was like a lot of people your age is childhood hero. He's oh, like for the sure. coolest yeah. dude. And he he's is. aged he's, he's aged guy. really well too. I am completely not surprised his body. That he can still walk. His face. Yeah. <laughs> the next couple of years showed that Colin had a lot of work to do to get a shot at the title. The trial with Peugeot didn't lead to a lasting partnership, unfortunately. Instead, Colin switched to a rear-wheel drive Ford Sierra Cosworth RS. Hell yeah. Yeah, baby. In fact, Colin, his dad Jimmy, and his brother Alistair all eventually switched to Cosworth following the end of Group B. Very cool. Elsewhere in Europe, drivers like Carlos Sainz and Ari Vatanen were finding success with the car and with Carlos winning the Spanish rally in a Cosworth in 1988 and uh carlos signs is not the same carlos signs driving today in formula one that's carlos signs jr in formula one his dad was the rally guy uh and he's and he's he's still uh he still drives off-road he did the dakar this year whoa um, that's cool. yeah he's still out there he's still he's still out there prowling that seems like a fun nice family like they all eat dinner together every sunday um they they I, do seem uh yeah, I don't know about fun, but um, yeah, it's a little stuffy, but still a like stuffy. more a relatable stuffy. than I'm gonna say it. Verstappen and his family. I uh, am not a big fan of Max. I don't know, man. Verstappen, his dad also raced Formula One. Uh, his dad, uh, <laughs> not not a great guy. I think when it comes to that's what uh, I'm saying. There's some other there's some there's some other dramas out there, or uh, there's some. Some scandalous stuff that you can read about on your own time. I'm not going to say anything else on this podcast, but uh, kind of problematic guy. I don't know. It's, the signs are a little stuffy, I, I will say. But Carlos Carlos Jr. seems like a cool cool guy, and yeah, I wish him totally. the best at Ferrari next year. By 1989, Colin and his Ford were driving increasingly internationally, setting a pace of travel that would define his next few decades. He would be traveling a lot. The globe trotting paid off. Colin placed fifth at the WRC Rally New Zealand event, which was his best showing to date thus far. Despite some bright spots, however, good finishes were few and far between, unfortunately. Unlike his fellow Cosworth drivers, Colin was struggling on the bigger stage, and by the end of 1990, he had hit a rut in multiple events, including at the Isle of Man, where he had wiped out multiple times. He crashed or failed to finish. Colin McRae was driving flat out, but it wasn't enough to overcome the if-in-doubt side of his famous motto. The main problem was money. Rally was an expensive sport, especially when you were regularly totaling your cars. And it wasn't clear what path forward would be for Colin. Cue the arrival of Colin's guardian angel. This angel wasn't a prototypical one with wings, a halo, and a sweet shredded six-pack Collins angel took the shape of a balding British racing (laughs) team owner by the name 
of David Richards. That sounds more biblically accurate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Richards had a storied career in rally, both as a co-driver for legendary Finn Ari Vatanen, then later organizing rallies on behalf of a British tobacco company named Rothmans. Ooh, I think I know where this is going. Uh, I think I've heard of that company. I didn't know it was a tobacco company for a while, but turns out it is. In 1984, <laughs> David convinced Rothmans to team up with Porsche to fund a rally team that he would head up, and thus <gasps> David's business baby, a child known as ProDrive. Oh, <laughs> ProDrive, not Jathan. <laughs> no, not Jathan. ProDrive, ever heard of it? <laughs> was born. ProDrive would soon build relationships with other auto companies that wanted to invest in Rally, including a six-year stint with BMW. Ooh. In 1989, David got word that Subaru was interested in a new Rally venture to promote its cutting-edge all-wheel drive cars, and he convinced them to make a deal with ProDrive, and thus, the Subaru World Rally Team was born. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Oh, I forgot that that was a good I, I that forgot really that you good. like slap the baby when you take him out. I don't think they do it anymore. Well, they gotta clear the lungs somehow, right? Yeah, I think that's they, they have for? an apparatus now. I don't think they hang up it. Well, if yeah, we got any um uh doulas that listen to our show, <laughs> uh let us know if they uh if the if you still hold a baby upside down and smack it on the butt. Yeah. Going into the 1992 World Rally season, David was excited about his team's prospects. He had recruited his former teammate, Ari Vatanen, for one of the driver's spots, and he wanted Colin to take the second position. But why Colin McRae? Part of the reason may have been the press. Colin was increasingly attracting headlines for his aggressive driving, but the main reason was Colin's Jekyll and Hyde personality off and on the track. In David's words, Colin just had a special ingredient a sparkle in his eye, a determination and a competitive edge like I've never seen in any young driver I've ever met. I have. He never gave that away on first meeting him. It was very sort of here, this laid back, laconic approach to life. As soon as you put him behind the wheel of a car, though, he was a different sort of bloke. <laughs> a real jackal it on, I'd say. <laughs> the real two face, you know what I mean? <laughs> like when, you know, in Batman, when the Two-Face flips the coin, and my, which coin are we going to get? You wow. I can't believe that was a, all that guy. It was weird. That's that all that quote. Like it. He's, yeah, a he's, a, he's a dynamic kind of guy. He's got a lot of interests. What can you say? <laughs> yeah. So in case you're starting to think, Colin had hit the big time, think again. For the first ah. year of driving, Subaru Pro Drive offered him 10,000 pounds, about 1,400 thousand dollars in 2020 it was a humble salary but colin was elated now that he was on a team he no longer had to worry about paying for his car's upkeep out of pocket his money problems were greatly eased colin brought along as his co-driver Derek ringer a fellow scotsman who had known the mccrays for years colin got off to a hot start with subaru pro drive winning the 1991 and 1992 british rally championships the same event that his dad had won five times in the 80s look at me dad i'm the british rally champion now <laughs> while jimmy's last two victories had come in the ford cosworth colin was now driving the group a subaru legacy rs the Legacy was an absolute beast. In fact, the same car had just set a land speed endurance record in Arizona when the same Legacy oh, yeah. was driven 62,000 miles in just 19 days at an average speed wow. of 138.8 miles per hour. And I'm pretty sure that that in average included when they were switching drivers and refueling and the car was going zero. Jeez. Yeah, so they were just driving in a big circle, right? Uh-huh. <clears throat> if you want to learn more about the Legacy... And uh, the story of Subaru, the beginning of Subaru All-Wheel Drive, we've done a couple episodes of Up to Speed on it. You can check that out at our YouTube channel. Donut Media. Outside of England, however, Colin's performance was often more spotty. In Finland, he wrecked his legacy in the reconnaissance run. Oh, luckily, on, he and his car were still able to make it to the main event. Or maybe unluckily, because Colin would go on to crash three more times. <laughs> and when we say crash, we don't mean spin out or hitting a sapling or two we mean three full-on 
Barrel Roll Wipeouts. Oof. By now, Colin had earned a nickname, Colin McCrash. It's pretty that good. summed up both his appeal and his stretches of spotty driving. Pretty good. By pretty th- good nickname. Dude, that's a sick name. Boy, there goes Colin McCrash over there. Hey, cool. it's Isn't like it? Launchpad McQuack. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, by the end of the event, <laughs> Colin's legacy looked like a battered trash can, but incredibly, despite the four crashes, he'd ridden it to an eighth place overall finish. That's one of the coolest things about watching rally is when they just like flip over and then they're like maybe get out to look at their car for a second and then just drive off. Yeah. It's <laughs> so cool. For the 1993 season, Subaru unveiled the new Impreza, which came along with a now iconic color scheme, electric blue paint with bright letter 555 lettering. Oh, yeah. A British tobacco sponsor splashed across the hood. The car soon became known as the Impreza 555. Triple five, baby. Colin drove the car to his first World Rally victory in New Zealand. Over the years, the island nation would become Colin's favorite race, specifically for the roads, which he praised as fast and fluid. Ooh, yeah. The next year, still driving the Impreza 555, Colin set his sights on an event that had eluded his father's grasp, the Royal Automobile Club Rally of Great Britain, which as an official World Rally event eclipsed the British Rally Championships in prestige. The event hadn't been won by a Brit in nearly 20 years ever since Roger Clark won in 1976. Colin had actually led the race at points for the previous three years in a row, but crashes had meant that the wins would instead go to to Yua Kinkunin and Carlos Sainz, the latter of whom was now his teammate on Subaru. This year, it was Carlos who would crash out of the race. Roger Clark himself presented Colin with the trophy. There you go. Brought it back. Brought it back to good old jolly old England there, mate, ain't it? Oi, but I ain't British, am I? I'm Scottish. The next year, 1995, would be a trying season for Rally. The previous year's championship had been won by Juha Kankanen. Kankanen. (laughs) And, and, uh, geez, this is a name. Didier Oriol. Didier Oriol of the Toyota team, who had dominated in the points total. It wasn't Toyota, however, but Colin's teammate, Carlos Sainz, who had got off to a hot start, winning two of the three events in Monte Carlo and Portugal. Colin, though, got off to a slow start, being forced to retire in Monte Carlo and Sweden. It wasn't until the fifth of eight events in New Zealand that Colin started to get hot. After Carlos had to withdraw from the race after hurting himself in a mountain bike accident, Colin, rather, took his first win in the season. He followed this up with a second-place finish in Australia, while Carlos, who had previously been at the top of the points, was forced to retire. All this led up to the penultimate race of the season in Carlos' home country of Spain. The two teammates had managed to outperform Toyota's favored drivers and were at the top of the point standings. However, despite their dominance, a scandal diverted attention from the budding inter-team rivalry. I know where this is going. The FIA, which is the sanctioning body of the WRC, mandated that each car be run with a restrictor plate on their turbo to limit the amount of air that could be drawn by the engine. In Spain, however, it was discovered that Toyota had secretly modified their restrictor plates so that while it appeared perfectly normal upon inspection, when it was installed, a set of hidden springs created a 5 millimeter gap between the restrictor and the turbo allowing as much as 25% more extra air into the engine. In response, Toyota's drivers, who FIA determined were unaware of the cheat, were stripped of their points and disqualified from the remaining two races. That doesn't sound like something Toyota would do. But they did. It's one of the most um, ingenious cheats of all time. I can still not really conceptualize how it works uh, because it can only work when it's installed. Like you can't really see how it works. That's how genius this yeah. engineering That's some is. Good machining there. Yeah. So these were the circumstances going into the rally at Catalonia that led to Colin refusing to back down from contesting the race against his teammate Carlos, which of course we covered at the beginning of this episode. The two were neck and neck in points, and with the Toyota disqualified, no other driver was even close to the two leaders. In the end. Colin ended up listening to the advice of his dad and allowed Carlos to win the event. The final event of the year was the British Rally Championship. Uh, Colin started the race mad, still heated from the events in Catalonia. Two days into the event, he and Sainz were yet again neck and neck, but a tire puncture 
dropped McRae back by a minute. Still, Collins' aggression kept him in the race. In the forest stage, Collin was stopped by a bent suspension component, but fans helped him lift up the car so that McRae and his co-driver, Derek Ringer, could bang the part back into the shape with a log. Nice. <laughs> by day three, despite the setback, McRae had started to build a commanding lead. Motorsport Magazine compared it to another great driver in a different discipline who is famous for his aggression and flow, saying that McRae had entered the same, quote, quasi-spiritual zone that Ayrton Senna had spoken about only a few years earlier in Monaco. Quite simply, nothing could stop him. In the end, McRae beat Sainz by 36 seconds, winning 18 of 28 stages. Oof. Colin McRae had done it. He had achieved the promise he had made to his girlfriend, Allison, years ago. But he had not yet performed with the consistency of his dad, but he had won on a bigger stage than Jimmy. In fact, he had surpassed not just his dad, but all of his fellow Brits, becoming Britain's first ever World Rally Champion. Wow. Over two million came to watch him win. As one journalist described it, quote, bagpipes echoed through the mountains of Wales as Colin drove through stages where spectators lined every mile. Not only was he the first UK winner, at the age of 27 and 109 days, he was the youngest man ever to win the title, besting Yua Kankanen's record by about four months, and I'm very sorry that I butchered Yua's name. It's just a lot of consonants. <laughs> <laughs> In the words of Pro Drive Subaru owner David Richards, quote, You'd think that I gave him a break, but he gave us a big break. Colin hadn't just won at It reminds Rally. me of Batman. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, David. Uh, Colin just hadn't just won at Rally. <laughs> His passion and joy for the sport had elevated it to a new level. People had questioned what would come for the sport after Group B ended and there was no longer the attraction of seeing the most powerful cars compete. The answer to that question was finally clear. It was Colin McRae. Next week on Pass Gas, we'll talk about what came next for Colin McRae as he continued to race rally, help launch one of the most popular rally video games ever, and help build a legacy that would one day come to an abrupt and tragic end. Oh, boy. Great episode. Love Great that Colin McRae. Love Colin Steele McRae. Colin Steele McRae, baby. Flying Scotsman. The Colin missile McCray. of the thistles, baby. The missile of the thistles. Love it. I'm a, I'm rooting for Carlos Sainz in this. Whoa. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> just, just, just to uh, play devil's advocate. Just to be a little devil stinker. Um, yeah, thank you so much for listening to this episode. I learned a lot, and I gained a lot of appreciation for Rally and Colin McRae. This was a fun one. Next week, probably not going to be as fun, but still very informative, so stick with us. Um, I've been Nolan Sykes. We didn't even introduce the host today. <laughs> Whoops. Oh, no. We <laughs> up. Sorry, I'm Nolan Sykes, joined as always by James Pumphrey. Yo! <laughs> <laughs> and Joe Weber. Fired up! Uh, you can follow the boys at James Pumphrey and Joe G. Weber. You can follow me at Nolan J. Sykes. Thanks to Bridget and Thomas. Thank you so much for listening. Tell a friend. Thanks, Wink Wink Nation. All right. Be kind. See you next time. Bye.